Коллеги, добрый день. Предлагаю всем присаживаться. Good morning, everybody. We are about to start. Please take your seats. Напоминаю, что сессию мы будем проводить. I would like to remind you that this session will be in Russian. So please use the interpretation devices. You can get the devices outside of this room. It will be more than 50% Russian. Итак, господа. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I would like to welcome you all here at this uh, plenary meeting that has been organized with the Gazprom Bank, and this will be about the development of the Russian industry and the supplies chain. My name is Grafinova Ivan Vladimirovna. I'm uh, first vice president of Gazprom Bank, and on behalf of Gazprom Bank, who is the organizer of this session, I would like to welcome you here in St. Petersburg. The weather is great today in Petersburg, and today we will be having only one hour, 15 minutes, so we are pressed for time. We will be talking about the industry, about the prospects for the development uh, of the Russian industry, on the advantages, disadvantages, on the problems, on our successes, and so on. And you know that the global economic system is uh, living through hard times, and uh, we have gathered here together uh, well, we speakers and uh, panelists, experts, Maxim Viktorovich Volkov is Director General of FOS Agro. Then uh, we have Chun King Lin, Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry of the Republic of uh, Korea, Klaus Mangold, Chairman of uh, the uh, Monitoring board and uh, Vladimir Rothschild, Dietrich Miller, who is the president and uh, the CEO of uh, Siemens, and Vladislav Alexandrovich Solovyov, who is first uh, deputy director of the Rusal company. Uh, the session is uh, held under the support of Gazprom Bank, and uh, well, from the beginning I would like to tell you about the format of this session because we have participants in the discussion in the first row sitting here in front of us. And um, uh, well, depending on the time, I will try to give them the floor and I will uh, introduce them a little bit later. But uh, well, please show us the first slide. Well, I believe that these slides will be for the purpose of illustration. We will be discussing things here without uh, presentation per se because we wanted to open a discussion. It will be an open discussion. and. If we have some time left over, we will be able to ask some questions. Well, please uh, write down your questions or just raise your hands and ask your questions by the end of this session. And I wanted to kindly ask the participants in the discussion. I will give you one to two minutes for your well, presentations. And um, how do you see the role of the Russian industry in the EU region economic space? Uh, what are the competitive advantages or maybe disadvantages uh, do you see in the Russian Federation? Therefore, Maxim Viktorovich, maybe we will start with you and uh, let us just go by the list. Uh, what do you think about this? Thank you, Katerina. I don't think I will be original here. Everybody knows what our advantages are in terms of competition. We have wide territories. Uh, well, if we look at the industries in the U.S., in Europe, uh, well, uh, the industry is uh, overburdening the environment and so on. We don't have these limitations for the time being because uh, the population is not that dense. We have an infrastructure unlike, unlike uh, many developing, in many developing countries, well, it leaves much to be desired, but still we have very well-trained personnel. Uh, if we talk about technical personnel, the mid-technical personnel, unfortunately, the professional level of this personnel is going down, unfortunately, I'm saying. And while well, companies are trying to train technical personnel on their own, but uh, while well, we're trying to resolve this uh, problem, and we see that uh, the level of education in Russia is much higher than in many other developing countries, so uh, we are situated 
between Europe and Asia, I believe that this is an advantage. Mr. Mayor. The real sector is the key in uh, restructuring the Russian economy. We're talking about introducing high technologies. We're talking about high tech jobs, which means that the uh, living standard will be growing, that the productivity will be growing, and so on. While talking about advantages in Russia, Russia is a huge market. And as a rule, business makes profit. And on the other hand, uh, in Russia, the businesses are closer to the resources. The machine building industry is well developed. The personnel is well trained. And there are many talented young people. But let us say that the infrastructure should be developed. I would not say that all the procedures are transparent, that there is no bureaucracy. And sometimes we come across some problems related to the procedure and the structures related to uh, the public orders, as we call them, when the government is ordering some work to be done. Well, compliance has to be improved. But we see that things are developing. We see Russia as a good base for exporting our products, at least to the CIS member states, Commonwealth of Independent States. Yes, we can talk about this a little bit later. Please show the next slide. Vadim. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. I uh, represent the unified machine building factories, and uh, well, this is part of the processing industry. Well, talking about the processing industry in uh, the world, it's only 16% of the world GDP and 14% uh, of the GDP in Russia. But this sector is still very important because it's about 70% of export, 7-0. And uh, most of the R&D projects in the world. Therefore, the processing industry is very important for trade, for R&D, research and development, and for boosting productivity, not only within this very sector, the processing sector, but in other sectors too. And uh, the surplus. The surplus in the, in the sector is uh, over $700 billion in the world. Well, now talking about industry in Russia, it's interesting to know that import in Russia is about $300 billion a year, and a little bit more than half goes from um, machine building and, well, equipment. I'm not talking about car building here because uh, cars bring another 12%. So this is a very important sign of the processing industry and uh, a lion's share of what we make from selling uh, oil and gas and other natural resources is spent to establish competitive technologies to process, to transport these natural resources and for other things. Uh, the role of uh, the Russian industry of the processing industry is very important and uh, it's about bringing in new competitive technologies to Russia and the future of the Russian industry depends on the, how competitive our natural resources sector will be. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid I, I will have to speak in English. Um, very briefly, I think that uh, energy and resources can work both as an uh, advantage and a handicap for Russia. Obviously, uh, easy supply of uh, abundant and cheap energy and resources can, be, uh, can work very well for the industries who use them as an input. But on the other hand, over-dependence on energy and resources 
can take away valuable investment from uh, the other industries, including knowledge-based industries, which is key uh, to help uh, Russian industries move up the chain of uh, uh, value. Um, hence, I think uh, the key challenge for Russia will be uh, taking advantage of energy and resources in such a way that uh, uh, Russian industries can move up the chain of value. Uh, I think uh, uh, the Norway's experience uh, can provide an excellent example in this regard uh, because uh, Norway, based on the experience of build, uh, uh, developing its oil reserves in North Sea, uh, has uh, also succeeded in establishing a world-class industry in designing and manufacturing uh, exploration and excava ex excavation uh, equipment. Thank you. Talking about competitive advantage, well, we have heard about this already. Well, we understand that we are located between uh, between uh, Europe and Asia Pacific. So on the one hand, we are in a unique situation because um, uh, the, uh, well, Asia, Asia Pacific, uh, well, produces about 60% uh, of the GDP and has 40% of the population of the world. And of course, we should use this advantage. But on the other hand, well, historically, our processing, our mining industry is uh, mostly located beyond uh, the Urals Mountains, which means closer to Asia Pacific on the one hand. But uh, on the other hand, of course, we have all these advantages. But is this enough? No, this is not enough. We need a good infrastructure to transport these resources to China, to Asian countries, to countries of the Asia Pacific Rim, and so on. Historically, we have an infrastructure. We have uh, railways on the one hand, but on the other hand, the volume of deliveries uh, and supplies to the, to the east is inadequate. The Soviet Union and the Russian Empire was uh, thinking about exporting these resources to the west, not to the east. Now we're looking eastward, and we're talking about uh, 80 million tons, and uh, the reconstruction of the Kuznetsov tunnel will make it possible to transport more. But if we uh, look at China, they uh, consume over 1 billion tons of coal. Well, uh, coal, excuse me. Well, what we're doing is inadequate, of course. So infrastructure is the key, developing west and East Siberia and the Far East is very important. We need to implement projects, ports, hubs, and so on. I agree 100 percent. And uh, uh, please, what do you think about this, Mr. Yes, um, Katarina, thank you. I believe certainly infrastructure is very important. Certainly a lot of uh, improvement of bureaucracy is important. But if we are talking about in industry and coming from a country which has a strong industrial commitment, I believe the first thing what one should have is a different mindset to push industry. <laughs> Up to now, Russia had always focused very much on raw material, on energy. Now, I believe it's time to change the mindset of the government and the people and to look for a new industrialization of Russia. Just two things. First, if you are looking to see export numbers, Russia depends for 75% stable over the last decades from raw material and energy. And it's only, to put it the other way around, with 25% integrated in manufacturing in the worldwide value chain of the worldwide business. I believe this has to change. Second, the successful countries of this world have a portion of round about between 23 and 30 percent uh, of industry which is contributing to the GNP. If you are falling down under such a level, you will have problems on the long run because you will be unable to employ all the people 
which you have only for uh, resources and, and uh, taking all these important things out of Earth and just to export it. And especially the recent examples as well in Europe show that we, if you don't have such a portion, you are going down. Look to what happens to France business. France had always a portion of round about 23, 24 percent of contribution of industry to the GNP. Today it's 16. This is one of the facts why the in French industry is not as successful as it has been a decade ago. So just in a nutshell, I believe a change of the, in, of the mindset for the priorities where Russian government wants to see its economic development in the future is of extreme importance. And afterwards, all other things can follow as infrastructure, less bureaucracy, and so on. But if you don't do this, and if you are always only looking to raw material, to energy, to gas, and to, to oil, I believe this country will be not on the level of its overall opportunities, especially having in mind as well the huge asset of human resources capital. This is, I believe, what the first priority would be, Srin, from my perspective. I can't agree more with what you're saying. This slide uh, illustrates uh, another point that I would like to make about the lack of investments. Under Some of the sectors are underfunded, underinvested. Hence the need to uh, raise investments, particularly foreign investments and direct investments in order to foster our manufacturing sector, Mr. Vadim. I would like to um, address my question to you. Now, natural inborn advantages that Russian industry has uh, has to do with uh, what you were saying right now. So my point is, uh, what um, competitive advantage um, does the Russian economy have in order to be able to expand, uh, not only to Europe, but also to Asian Pacific markets? What determines our success and the lack thereof? Thank you, Yekaterina. Let me first go start with your first question about the current status of uh, um, Russia's manufacturing industries. This question should uh, be rephrased in the following way. Let's distinguish between the mining sector versus manufacturing sector. Our current statuses are different. The good news is that, that our main mining industry, oil and gas sector and energy, these industries uh, at some point in time went through a um, stage of uh, high prices, uh, uh, which was the result of a uh, an aggressive growth of demand on the part of China and other Asian nations. Now, this trend has been balanced off by some other factors, and uh, um, Russia benefited from this stage. Uh, and luckily, the revenues generated by uh, those experts uh, have been smartly invested in the manufacturing sector in order to foster diversification of our economy. Hence, the good news. However, uh, the level of productivity is lagging behind compared to foreign nations. Uh, moving on to the manufacturing sector, where um, uh, innovations are more intense and uh, um, human capital uh, matters more. Uh, here, there's a long way to go to be able for Russia to integrate with the national systems. For the last 10 to 12 years, the following dynamics has been taking place. Let's take the growth of uh, payroll. 2100 um, was the average payroll amount, whereas now the current um, payroll amount is 25,000 rubles per, per month before. So we're talking about a 12 fold growth with the with a uh, permanent uh, currency rate of dollar versus uh, US dollar or euro so which uh, we're talking about which means that we're talking about some radical changes uh, at some point in time resources were relatively well, inexpensive and relatively expensive labor now 
uh, we're talking about completely different. It's not that we have been, are having this um, jump start. Uh, on the contrary, we have uh, we are having this jump start now, as opposed to other nations. And mm, um, this is something that enables us to believe that uh, we are falling into this m middle income trap. Uh, category of nations, which means that out of, of 114 nations, only 18 uh, managed to um, get rid of this uh, situation. Because if you are talking about six to eight uh, thousand dollar per uh, GDP per capita, I'm talking about per capita GDP, then uh, your growth is likely to slow down, down to two percent per year. In order for you to um, jump out of this trap. You need to uh, um, make this breakthrough. Like Klaus Mangold, absolutely, he was right. We need to um, build information and knowledge-based economy, innovation-based economy. This is about increasing productivity. This is about improving the human uh, part of this equation. And uh, in order for us to overcome this uh, situation, we need to upgrade uh, not only the manufacturing sector, but also we need to upgrade our mentality, our, the way we think, our thinking. And if I may, I would like to quote Albert Einstein, who said, you will never be able to solve uh, an emerging problem unless, I mean, if you keep all the approaches uh, that actually brought you to be faced with this problem. So hence the need for us to change the paradigm to change our mentality, to make this mental breakthrough so that we can undertake the necessary means to um, move on to intent to innovation-based uh, technologies. M moving on to your second question about what Russia, what the competitive edge uh, Russia's economy has uh, in order to be able to expand it to uh, European and Pacific markets. So, the uh, first thing with, that we need to talk about, again, power and resources uh, in this um, world mix uh, of uh, industries. And our um, uh, mining industries uh, have, been, have been upgrading lately quite aggressively. And they are able to sell their um, deliverables at competitive prices. The issue is that the share of the manufacturing industry needs to be in, increased so that Russia's economy uh, becomes less dependent on, uh, oil and, on the oil and gas sector. So what impediments are we faced with? Number one, the uh, manufacturing industry, we're talking about 70% of uh, world export, including 16% of GDP. So there's a lot of uh, protectionism going on internationally. Take, uh, uh, for, uh, foreign automotive industries, uh, even with all due respect, uh, they um, uh, offer uh, competitive loans to their customers uh, at very competitive rates. Whereas here in Russia, there's a lot of declarations and statements have been made, unfortunately, um, inexpensive loans uh, are not yet available to uh, Russian consumers uh, who are interested in buying um, aut mm, automobiles. And uh, this lack of cheap resources is something that has been declared lately, but um, this is something that is, has not yet Im been implemented yet. Now, the other thing is that when it comes to some sensitive products, uh, I would all, again, all these talks about free trade, Still, there's a lot of t barriers uh, that uh, are in place, including the anti-dumping measures, uh, without pointing fingers, um, that protect uh, domestic steel makers, steel manufacturers, a lot of other technical um, barriers, such as specifications and certificates of uh, um, conformity and so forth. So the thing is that Russia is a vast uh, country, ge geographically speaking, in order for us to cons for consumers to transport coal from Kuzbaz elsewhere, this, uh, the tra very transportation costs build up and uh, they come to something that is 20% higher than the, um, the costs related to the extraction, to the extraction co costs. So geography matters indeed. Uh, and logistically speaking, 
uh, Russia um, has a lot of potential, of course. But again, again, this boils down to the need for us to improve the infrastructure. And uh, in order, if we want to improve um, the manufacturing sector, we need to invest in infra infrastructure first. And in conclusion, I would say that OMZ Group has been very successful in exporting uh, various uh, facilities, equipment, and I can, this can go on and on, and excavators and nuclear um, power plants, equipment for nuclear power plants and petrochemicals and so forth, right? Um, unfortunately, we have been faced with a lot of barriers. Yeah, had it not been for barriers, we could have uh, significantly enhanced our export uh, capabilities and um, thus improve our competitiveness competitiveness. Thank you, says the moderator. So our geography is our blessing and our curse at the same time. This, speaking of geography, let's look at this slide. Mas Maxim, um, here's your question. So we're talking about this rebalancing towards Asia-Pacific, right? This shift of paradigm. And let's talk about the role Russian economy plays in the world economy. What needs to be mentioned here is that after a certain, so Russia recently acceded to uh, WTO. So could you please elaborate on the implications uh, that Russia, Russian companies uh, have to deal with now as Russia is a full-fledged member of WTO now for them to expand to world markets, okay. With regard to WTO, the very accession to the WTO does not necessarily mean that all of your issues are solved automatically. No, this is just a tool that enables us, again, once supported by the government, to somehow protect our interests. And nearly 20 WTO member states apply various restrictions and barriers with regard to Russian commodities and goods. Some of them are unique and absurd, absurd. For example, in Brazil, Latin America, we uh, have to pay 6% um, uh, uh, surcharge because our fertilizers do not have ammonia, and the, which is a good thing for us because this is something that is detrimental to the environment. So we produce better stuff, but we have to pay a higher tax or import duty uh, for exporting um, something that is better in quality. And again, uh, well, again, like I said, accession to WTO does not solve all your problems. Um, we've had some difficulties in terms of our judicial system, for example. Our judicial system uh, is lagging behind and uh, is not up to the task in terms of all of the mm, tools. And uh, domestically speaking, we need to uh, uh, harmonize our um, domestic situation with the W standards uh, in terms of subsidies and cross subsidies and our group uh, is now in the middle of some litigation cases so we'll see and we are already experiencing some difficulties and we see that uh, our um, judicial system lacks expertise in order to solve such um, uh, uh, puzzles uh, and I would like to support uh, our colleagues my colleagues who mentioned the need for Russia to uh, improve its mm, infrastructure another couple of examples um, the United States 7.7 7, thousand uh, tons is the average uh, weight of, uh, in case of uh, um, uh, export uh, capabilities, whereas our number is 3,500. In other words, uh, mm, the mm, quality of uh, highways uh, is several times better in the West than in Russia. And we're talking about 150 kilometers tops that we have. Uh, um, so in other words, uh, it, it takes a lot of much more effort here for Russia to uh, transport uh, goods uh, where uh, from where they are manufactured uh, to terminals. Um, and the speed uh, also be much to be de desired. There's a lot of traffic jams uh, if we're talking about. Um, auto, uh, about uh, auto transportation. Mr. Babayev can correct me if I'm wrong. He's the expert in this field. But the, yes, we talk about container uh, trains. They have two tiers. Now, our infrastructure, it does not make it possible for us to uh, put two, I mean, two containers in like two tiers because uh, the power line uh, is pretty low. Uh, there's a number of other restricting factors indeed. 
Uh, so if we look at our geography, the paradox is that uh, um, we uh, uh, load uh, fertilizers on term on uh, containers. Uh, containers actually are transported to uh, our end customers out there in Africa, Asia, wherever. Unfortunately, our domestic farmers um, are misserviced, and they do not have access to the same batch of fertilizers as uh, uh, our customers abroad. Moving on to the issue of uh, co economic oppression, Mr. Ken Klim, if I may ask my question, your uh, perspective on the current um, uh, situation in terms of cooperation between Russia and your country and in Asia in general, so both now, today, and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in nine, uh, 2009, the bilateral trade between Korea and Russia was about uh, 10 billion US dollars. Last year, it reached uh, 22 billion dollars, uh, representing more than 100 percent increase uh, over three years. Uh, this is a very uh, welcome development, but um, uh, this is not large enough uh, given the fact that uh, uh, Korea's uh, total trade with the world stands at more than one trillion US dollars. So $22 billion uh, is about 2% of Korea's, whole, uh, Korea's uh, trade with the whole world. On the investment uh, side as well, uh, the two-way flow of investment between Korea and uh, Russia uh, are not uh, very large, uh, despite the fact that uh, recently some Korean companies, including uh, Hyundai Automobiles, uh, Samsung Electronics, and LG Electronics, made a sizable investment in Russia. I think uh, uh, from a more positive perspective, uh, this indicates that uh, there is uh, great room for uh, uh, expanding the flow of uh, trade and investment between Korea and uh, Russia. And there are other elements that facilitate uh, that facilitates uh, uh, the, the economic interaction between the two countries. For example, uh, both countries have a sizable domestic markets. Uh, Russia is, I understand, uh, the ninth largest economy in the world. Korea is the 15th largest economy in the world. And both countries are very close uh, to each other ge geographically. I think uh, uh, we have uh, uh, two areas which uh, offer uh, best uh, prospect for closer uh, interaction. Uh, the first is uh, obvious one, energy and resources. Uh, Korea does not uh, have any natural resources, so we have to import huge amount of uh, natural resources, including food stuff, sources for energy, etc., etc., from outside, which uh, Russia can supply in plenty. On the other hand, uh, Korea has world-class uh, engineering and plant industry, which I think can help Russia uh, make better use of its abundant uh, natural resources and energy. The second area for uh, closer economic cooperation is technology. Um, Russia has made a great achievement in many areas, in including medical science, space science, uh, and Korea uh, has uh, uh, world-class manufacturing technology that can translate uh, the science and ideas into concrete uh, uh, products. Uh, for example, uh, if we can combine uh, the, the great achievements Russia has made in the area of medical science with uh, information technology of Korea, I think uh, we will see some very uh, uh, interesting and very popular products in the world market. Of course, uh, having an institutional framework which can facilitate the two-way 
flow of uh, trade and uh, investment between the two countries can uh, be very helpful. For example, uh, if we have a free trade agreement between Korea and uh, uh, Russia, I think uh, we will have a much larger flow of uh, uh, trade and investment between the two countries in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I can't agree more with what you're saying. That it's not all about trade and bilateral interaction. It's all about uh, mutual contacts, and this is something that um, can help us improve uh, our economic uh, development, not only amongst the two countries involved, but also um, beyond. Mr. Vladislav, uh, you already mentioned um, the growth of operations between Russia and its uh, eastern partners. So could you, could you elaborate on this one again and what role is being played by development of eastern regions within Russia? That's, uh, I think, uh, deserves some special focus. Yes, indeed, we um, do have a lot of experience in working with uh, a number of Asian nations, including China, particularly China two years ago. We started a partnership with the Norinco company so that we can expand uh, I mean, our presence in China and move our goods uh, in China, as you know. Mm, China has their own ex exchange system and their own VAT refund system, and we are interested in further cooperating with the uh, mentioned company. And we're talking about the highly competitive market, and Chinese companies uh, are very competitive uh, compared to Russian companies. Now, it might be a good idea to compare our competitive uh, edges uh, as a nation, as an industry, like compared to what's used be the case 10 years ago, because our partners, uh, global partners, pay attention to this particular um, factor, which is competitiveness. Now, why don't we look at two or three relevant factors, such as the cost of power and the cost of labor, like something that was uh, mentioned briefly by uh, my colleagues here, compared to what even used to be the case in five years ago. Uh, power has grown in prices and labor has grown as well. So the industry, our industry has been losing this competitive edge, including in eastern regions where prices historically have always been lower um, uh, thanks to a large number of hydro uh, logical resources. Um, and uh, again, the need to um, implement a reform, but the, the reform that is now being underway has to be revised. Uh, we need to, of course, uh, switch to power uh, saving, energy saving technologies. We need to be power um, effective, uh, but there's something that will take time, and we need to uh, make sure that uh, domestic um, specific features are captured in whatever we try to do. Now, like I said, powers, uh, prices are going up and labor costs are going up, which is, as a matter of fact, uh, a good thing. Of course, the um, workers need to be uh, compensated adequately, but at the same time, the government needs to um, make sure that uh, dollar to uh, ruble exchange rate needs to be somehow, I don't know, adjusted uh, in order to make everybody happy, both our exporters and our <laughs> labor and uh, importers. And uh, maybe this is something that can help uh, exporters, if uh, this exchange rate uh, is uh, to be adjusted, maybe this is something that our mm, banking sector needs to be uh, needs to be aware to be careful. So ruble has to be devalued, depreciated against the dollar. This is something which uh, uh, can. Uh, um, help us a lot, our exporters, basically. Now, we are um, improving the infrastructure. We're building new uh, terminals. We're building new uh, hydro power plants. And then the question is asked, so what's going to happen to productivity, to the payroll, 
uh, levels and to uh, exchange rates. So all of these factors are fraught with risks that uh, exporters are very uh, uh, cautious about. So the government needs to perhaps somehow improve the predictability and stability of the system, not to scare away exporters. And basically, um, eastern regions are abundant in uh, natural resources now. What is lacking is human resources, so we need to improve the infrastructure by building this plant in the Tayushne village, which is not far from Goshansky hydroelectric plant, but there's nothing just in the middle of nowhere. And our task is just to build a f functional town in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Taiga. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be suffering from the lack of uh, labor. So we need to, this is something that um, needs to be supported by the federal government and the regional government as well. And this is not about uh, just, uh, I don't know, paying some extra uh, benefits to uh, those uh, workers, but also this is about to make sure that the quality, that they get access to reasonable quality of life there. Thank you. Getting back to the issue of uh, currency and uh, foreign currency, particularly uh, policy, monetary policy, this is something that really makes everybody cautious, uh, mm, particularly lately against the backdrop of uh, recent developments. And we know that the president of the Russian Federation has instructed the government to um, study this issue and what uh, impact this uh, policy can have on both the oil and gas sector and the manufacturing industry as well. The next slide is about mm, uh, something else. It's not mm, uh, so Europe uh, still mm, is, uh, has been, is, and will be perhaps one of the major uh, trade partners of the Russian Federation. Mr. Mueller uh, is now taking the floor to elaborate on uh, this issue. So. Uh, what role uh, Russia is playing in European uh, Russian cooperation, whether or not European companies are interested in uh, enhancing their presence in Russia, in what areas, and one lines of work, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Trofimova. You said it right. Indeed, Russia is an important uh, player in the world economic um, um, system. Siemens is presence in uh, over 100 countries in the world, and Russia is one of the, and has been and is one of its uh, major strategic partners. Uh, this is not about uh, us building this uh, single European uh, uh, system starting from Lisbon all the way down to uh, Vladivostok, all the way, I mean, to the east of Vladivostok. So, uh, but not only that, and for, um, uh, I know that many European companies, not only Siemens, uh, is, uh, uh, they are planning on expanding their presence in Russia because there's demand, there's huge demand in Russia for high-tech uh, products, uh, services uh, coming from uh, Western European countries. And in addition to that, uh, there are f sources of uh, funds uh, um, generated by uh, export revenues, uh, again, experts coming from uh, the oil and gas sector. Siemens and other players, they focus on the large infrastructure related projects such as power, not only generation, this is about grid and distribution grid and distribution systems and oil and gas, of course, transportation infrastructure is there as well that uh, needs to be uh, further developed and some other lines of work, including the manufacturing industry. And as a result, we have a billion euro worth program of investment in Russia, and uh, we are planning to create about uh, 4,000 new jobs. Well, we're talking about the rolling stock by the SPS group. We are investing about 200 million euro in that project alone, and our partner, Scenario, is investing another 200 million, so it's 400 million euro. Well, we're talking about uh, the modern, uh, the modern trains that were introducing some electro technology, high voltage transformers, switching stations in uh, Voronezh, and this is not only about production; it's about uh, R&D also. So. 
uh, there will be two R&D centers and uh, eight factories that will be producing this rolling stock and all the rest that I have been listed. So uh, there is a lot of discussion. Uh, there are many problems, but we still decide. We still believe that r the Russian economy has a great capacity, and um, in the long run, it will not be able to satisfy its needs only through importing products. So we will have to help uh, Russia produce within the territory of the country. So if uh, we want to be optimistic, optimistic, we should ask ourselves the question, what should we do to stimulate GDP, new investment, and so on? I'm looking at other countries that are working in this domain, and uh, Russia can follow in their footsteps. I believe that a, a large public sector it's, is not always a disadvantage, but sometimes an advantage if the public or government sector is uh, really working out uh, the policies that uh, provide orders to the producers and so on. But uh, Russia should uh, simplify its bureaucratic procedures should give tax breaks to producers and so on, and, uh, uh, well, support export to third countries. So all these projects are being uh, discussed, but uh, they are not used to their full capacity in the Russian economy. Well, I would like to make some remarks related to the exchange rate of the ruble to the dollar and euro. So what do investors need? The investors need stability in the long term. Long term stability is very important, so uh, I'm very careful when we start discussing these issues. There are many factors that play in, but the main factor is the stability of economic development in Russia. Thank you very much. I would like to rephrase something that you have said. I believe that predictability is another key word. And at Gazprom Bank, we are working a lot with our customers, with clients, with our partners, and so on. And well, predictability is a buzzword in our dialogue with them. And to illustrate what you have said, I would like to draw your attention to the, to the slide. Look at the red curve. Please, uh, this red curve uh, shows that we are right in what we're saying. And while I believe that the European Union feels rather comfortable, though the situation is not that good. And here I'm talking uh, about the fact that in the total GDP of the region, total export is, export is growing. And of course, this holds a promise for the Russian economy. Mr. Mangold. I would like to give the floor to you because, uh, well, you will have to tell us about an issue that is maybe the most important, though it's a short one, but, uh, well, it will demand some openness, some extra openness on your side. Is the Russian infrastructure attractive for foreign investors? Thank you. If I'm traveling uh, in <coughs> Russia, in the provinces, and uh, I have just been over the last few months in cities as Yekaterinburg, in Rostov, in Perm, in Tumen. This has developed in an unbelievable way. And uh, I believe you find always a lot of things which are not working. But if you are looking around the world and as a foreign investor, where do you find uh, much better infrastructures than in Russia? Go to China, go to, to India, go to Brazil. You don't find an ideal world as, an, as an, a company who is looking to intensify its business. And if I'm looking back five or ten years ago, in all of the cities in the Russian provinces, a lot of things have been done. And so I believe really infrastructure is very important. But it is certainly not the major point by which Russia is lacking behind uh, on an international benchmark comparison. I believe really was what Russia needs is uh, 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 other things. You must, I believe, think about a mentality to develop a middle class. If you are not developing a middle class, um, which is taking innovation, entrepreneurial leadership, and which is taking uh, a spirit to change with innovative products, 
I believe this is much more important than everything else. And the backbone, for example, of Germany is a middle class. These are not the very big companies, and I'm speaking on, a, on behalf of a company where I was working most of my career, which is Daimler and Mercedes-Benz. The driver of innovation in German companies are not the big heroes. Um, this is the middle class, which are the suppliers and which we have a very good uh, work share and the split responsibility just in innovation. And very often they are the drivers. If you are looking to industrial products, Korea has made a lot of efforts, China has done. But where is this product uh, on behalf of the Russian industry where you have developed in a broad way some high visibility? I don't see this up to now. And I believe really this is something where we have to work on. Everything we have is uh, about uh, energy and uh, with high and good brands, but for industrial products we are missing this. And I believe one should look to some of the examples around the world. Korea has done a great job in investing in industry. China has done this. Brazil is just in a way to do it. So why is Russia not in the same speed in doing so? Uh, and, and this is my point which I was mentioning before as well, Katharina. I, I believe that we have to change the industrial concept of this country if we would like to, to make a step forward. Energy is a huge asset for us as investors because everybody is looking for cheap energy and today in many companies the price of energy, gas and oil is more important than the price of labor. So this is a huge advantage and, and just as well for integrating Russia in a global picture. But the industrial mindset is, is, is key and to develop as well a, and Vadim and myself had a lot of discussions about this, how to organize innovation. I, I, innovation is not coming from the heaven. It is a, a very tough job to be done on a daily basis. And um, it is very much linked with a lot of transfer of technology and openness and to bring foreign investors to Russia and as well, and I'm talking as well about not only bringing technology to Russia, but as well to encourage Russian companies to be more active in doing joint ventures outside of the country. And look, looking for what you can do in bringing a, chi a, a Russian company in a strategic alliance with a European, American, or whatever. And if you are following now what the Chinese, for example, are doing, they are pushing the Chinese industry out of the country under one circumstance, that they are afterwards bringing back technology. This is, I believe, something which is in the interest of everybody. And um, Russia should be more active in FDIs outside of Russia and to develop with this transfer of technology. And so, in a nutshell, innovation, the entrepreneurial mindset, to, to push as well forward that um, a middle class is developing fast. In some of the areas, it develops quite well, but uh, there is a question of speed and to develop this even more and not always to look forward what can energy and, and energy supply do in terms of trade. And if I'm looking to this curb, I believe uh, that it, it's, it's, it looks very nice, but you have to see what is a portion of manufacturing in this trade curb. And, you will, and it will be small. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Katarina. Uh, thank you very much. Talking about the Russian industry, well, this is no easy topic, and I believe that our discussion would not be complete had we not been speaking about the role of the state and the government policy. I would like to address this uh, question to all the panel members here. Well, I know that there are many opinion polls uh, held among the directors of factories and uh, companies in Russia and abroad and while well, they are saying that uh, the government policies are very important they influence the industry the output well could you tell us about the government policy and uh, how successful is the Russian economy in relation to this in a nutshell I would like to 
subscribe to what uh, my colleagues have uh, said 100 percent the government policy should be stable rules can be bad rules can be good but people should understand that these rules will be adhered to period but they should be efficient no i believe i believe that efficiency comes second but they should uh, be adhered to Well, I have spoken already about the specific role of the government, how it can stimulate the economic development of a given country. But I would like to give you a couple of examples. Uh, guaranteed state order. The state order is something to be done. When, when uh, Mr. Yikunin said, I want to have uh, a local production of the electric trains and train cars here. We want to produce them in Russia, 98%. We said, OK, Mr. Ikunin, from the Russian railways. So we said, how many do you need? We, we, we said, we can produce 1,200. So we discussed this issue. We have a project until 2020. And together with uh, Sinara, we are investing 200 million uh, rubles to establish this new production. This is what I mean when I say a guaranteed order. Customs regulation, for example, when you import a gas turbine from abroad and it's cheaper than to produce it within the country, and then you have to buy spare parts and units in another country. Uh, per one euro on investment, you can, you can get one euro of tax breaks in some countries, and this uh, is an incentive. And while well, we are fighting for investment, I can say it this way, and uh, we need s certain plans uh, related to financing, financing the industry that produces goods to be exported to third countries. Well, the energy sector, the transportation sector, and uh, well, there are many topics that we can talk about here, but there should uh, be programs, very specific problems, uh, programs, excuse me, to stimulate this investment. On my own behalf, I can tell you about several issues that are very important for us. In Russia, there are many targeted programs that are working very well. They have huge budgets. And it is very important for the government to provide these budgets to the Russian companies. These companies should have high tech, should have contemporary technologies, and so on. So we need a large market to produce. If we look at China, China has become a member of the WTO before us. It is part of the world economic system, and it has found its niches to export. We are in a different situation. So the market is key here. Second, as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian writer, said, well, the most important thing is to preserve the people, to preserve the talented people. We have lost one, we have lost hundreds of thousands of people. People are leaving, there is a brain drain, and these people are the most talented ones. They create this value added in other countries, not in this country. To bring down the administrative barrier, this is another task of ours to stimulate SMEs, small and medium enterprises. Next. I quite agree with my colleagues who were speaking before me. It's impossible to compete when tariffs grow by 15 percent, one five, every year. And uh, well, now I believe the economic conditions are not very good for us. And uh, per one unit of uh, production, labor is more expensive, energy is more expensive, licenses are more expensive, capital is more expensive, and so on. So uh, we are in a bad position compared with other countries. So I believe that we should not be developing extensively. We should start developing intensively. And then we should create a good environment. I'm talking about the infrastructure, the educational system. 
I want to comment. Well, some people come back. And I worked in France for over 15 years, and Denis Shelikov is raising his hand here. He is uh, head of the Department of uh, Capital Markets, and he has worked in London for many years, but he has come back, so he is created, creating a value added in this country. So this policy is efficient, as bringing people together. Mr. Ken Lim, what do you think about the role of the government? Though it uh, might not be easy for you because you represent the government. I think that uh, uh, one of the things that the government can do for the long-term industrial development is to create and maintain uh, a, a competitive environment. Uh, because uh, in Korea's experience, uh, we have learned that uh, in the absence of a competitive environment, it's very difficult to have competitive industry. Uh, I agree with uh, those people who say that uh, you need to give protection to the industry at an <coughs> early stage. Yes, it is true. Uh, you cannot develop uh, a domestic industry uh, with a free competition. You have to provide the support and you have to protect them from uh, competition from outside so that they can establish and grow up to a certain point. But after a while, uh, you have to start to reduce and remove the protection. Uh, once uh, the industry realizes that uh, there is going to be uh, protection forever, they will stop uh, their efforts to enhance their uh, competitivity, uh, competitiveness. They will stop making efforts uh, to make innovation. Um, I think uh, the, the case of a Korean electronics uh, industry provides good example. Uh, the Korean government provided uh, quite high level of uh, protection to the electronics industry in the form of high tariffs and uh, 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 various uh, forms of uh, non-tariff uh, non barriers. Uh, they were successful in a sense, but they remained as a second-class player for an extended period of time. <coughs> and it was only after the Korean government started to reduce the protection and support that they started to make breakthroughs and compete uh, on equal terms with the companies from the United States and Europe and Japan. Of course, uh, you cannot remove protection overnight. The industry will need the time to adjust. But I think it's very important for the government to provide a very clear and um, uh, predictable uh, time schedule for the reduction and ultimately removal of the uh, protection so that the industry can prepare itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will agree that uh, the government policy should be stable and efficient, but there is one more important thing. It should be concentrated on resolving the issues that are urgent here and now. And I believe that developing infrastructure is the most important point. Let's see what we have in this country. We have a huge territory and we have an energy infrastructure. We have a transportation infrastructure and it's uh, rather distributed and diversified. So what was built in the Soviet Union was uh, modernized a little bit in uh, the Russian Federation. But, uh, well, in the past, uh, the single budget of the Soviet Union was paying for this. So to do the same thing through tariffs is, uh, is impossible. So the government should understand that its budgets should actively work to finance the infrastructure, including transportation. So uh, if uh, infrastructure products will, go, will be growing through a growing tariff, we will not be competitive. We are losing competitiveness already, and uh, we will be even worse in this case. So infrastructure is key. Another domain is modernization, innovation. We should understand that innovation is the right direction where we're moving, but uh, maybe we should not invest in technologies that we do not have. Maybe we should uh, use the contemporary technologies that other countries are using, that they're producing, and so on. And we should make our country more contemporary and then start producing our own instead of 
reinventing the bicycle or inventing something that doesn't exist and that we don't need. Number three, infrastructure, social infrastructure for Siberia and the Far East. Well, I go to Siberia and I see that Novosibirsk, Krasnoyarsk, other cities are faring better than they were, but let's uh, look beyond these cities, the villages, the settlements, well, people are leaving these villages, and uh, we see uh, that uh, the population outside the cities is uh, compressing, is contracting. And if we want to develop our industry, and we do want to develop it, we should focus on these cities. We should look at mono cities, mono towns, as we call them, when they have only one factory per, per city. I'm not talking about Krasnoyarsk, Novosibirsk. These are giants. But uh, if we talk about oil and gas deposits, they are not far away from these villages, villages that hardly have any people living there. So I believe that to develop these villages is a very important task, well, to provide an in infrastructure. And uh, this is something that the government should do. And uh, then people will go there not only to make, to make uh, money, but uh, just to live there, Nature is beautiful there, housing may be cheap there, and so on. So that this is uh, the three missions. Mr. Mangold, you have been telling us about uh, innovation, about developing the human capital, intellectual capital. How do you see the role of the government on this issue? I believe that the government should have a very clear strategy, which is, and I repeat it, just going about industrialization. Everything is okay with, in, with the energy sector. And in the energy sector, the government has taken a strong commitment and they are as well looking forward how to organize in between the major players in these countries. If you look to the re recent development, uh, what, what's happening in terms of size of the main players. But I, what I'm missing is really the very clear industrial approach. And I give you one example. There has been a lot of saying about privatization. Privatization had been a key word three, four years ago. But what happened in reality? Not so much. And uh, I believe this is a point where the government should be more orientated in execution compared to what, say, what it's told to the industry, to the public. So this is not a problem of, of having the right level of, of knowledge, but it's a problem to execute and to bring these things done. And if, for example, you would like to build up a middle class, which is very easy to be done, and it's shown in a lot of countries how to do it. This is not a secret. And you can have tax incentives, you can have a lot of encouraging, and you take the privatization as a tool of outsourcing with young entrepreneurs coming in and to do a reasonable job. If you are doing this, you will have a completely new picture in the industry. So for me, it is not something where I believe that we are talking about miracles, but for me it's a question how to execute as fast as possible what you have to do in changing the big picture. Predictability is always something where you can have a lot of questions, but just one question between us. Is India more predictable as Russia? Is China more predictable as Russia? I don't know. I don't know. This cannot be the key barrier. I believe the key barrier is really to have access to um, the right tools if it comes to very pragmatic things. Tax, WTO, predictability is certainly one thing, and not to change the rule of the, of the game, everything. If you are looking what's happening to the automotive industry, where you have always the feeling and, and the fact that so you are turning a little bit around and make new barriers just to bring imports a little bit down. This is something what foreign investors do not like. But uh, on the long run, I believe really that uh, Russia has a high potential to develop if it comes to execution of the few musts to develop the industrial picture. Yes, that's right, absolutely. When we look at specific projects, well, uh, we come to pragmatical issues. How much do you pay for this or that plant, for this or that object? Uh, how much labor costs? And our labor is very expensive on the one hand. On the other hand, it's not very efficient. It's not very productive. So this is a huge question mark. We have about five minutes left. 
till the end of this session, and as I promised, we have some time for Q&A. I would like to give the floor to our panelists and to our guests, because we might have omitted some things, maybe there are some questions, comments, and so on. But briefly, please, and then we'll give the microphone to our guests. The price of labor is not the decisive point. If this would be the decisive point, Germany would be bankrupt because we have the highest labor costs in Europe. The question is about efficiency, about productivity, and about how you manage things. So labor costs are only one point of the game, not the key decisive. Mm -hmm. Konstantin Rushkov, Fund. Konstantin Rushkov, the Russian Foundation of Direct Investment. FDI. We are talking about investment, we are talking about developing different sectors of the economy, of the industry, and so on. But there is one thing that we uh, come across. Well, you working with foreign partners, we trying to invite foreign investors. But the question is about perception. Historically, people are looking at Russia as a risk zone. Historically, traditionally. And uh, I, playing my role, have to spend most of my time to explain to our co-investors, foreign co-investors, why Russia is attractive for investment. If we compare Russia with uh, other countries of BRICS, I would not say that it's easier to invest in other countries than in Russia. Well, I'm talking about Brazil, India, China. But one way or another, they know how to sell their country, in a good sense of the word, of course. And, uh, well, they know how to advertise, and they do this better than in Russia. Well, talking about these things uh, and, uh, uh, well, discussing many projects or many draft projects for companies that want to get more investment, I can tell you that there are many projects and many companies that are attractive potentially for investors. So the biggest question mark is how do we sell these companies? Not sell the companies, but advertise them. How do we find the right partners for them? It's not easy. Easier said than done. On, the, on slide number four, can you show us slide number four, please? On slide number four, the curve showed a growth trend for investment in 2012-2013, investment in the Russian economy. The industrial sector is uh, one of the sectors that was growing in terms of uh, private investment, and we want to believe that part of our work is reflected in this, on this graph. In the past 18 months, we, together with our partners, foreign partners, invested over $2 billion into the industrial companies and other companies. And out of, well, out of uh, this country, we paid from the government fund about 600 million and 1.5 billion came from foreign partners. And uh, most of the companies were newcomers to Russia. Please know this. So perception is something that we have to break. And I believe that um, Every company in Russia should help us. And Mr. Babayev, we have been talking about RZD, the Russian Railways. So can you tell us something about this? Well, the Russian Railways company is working on um, using the foreign experience, localization, and so on. And we are working together with Siemens, Bombardier, Armstrong, and with uh, the leading companies in the world that possess the best technologies in the world. While well, we're trying to attract them to Russia, we are inviting them to Russia, talking about developing infrastructure. I believe uh, that uh, we are the only organization that has written down clearly its strategy until 2030. And we have presented uh, our strategy to the Ministry of Economic Development to other government ministries and bodies. So we have broken uh, the strategy down into several parts. One part is related to the projects that we can fund ourselves with our own money. And uh, we are showing the government what the country will get, not only the Russian railways are 
ZD. We're talking about the development of the Far East, about the development of Eastern Siberia. Eastern Siberia and the Far East will not be developing without the railways. And uh, while we are talking about the energy sector, and this energy sector is uh, bringing a lot of profit, and this profit can be used to bring in technology to the Far East. We hardly have anything else to sell in the world market, so we have to develop the Far East to export more. With regard to a changing the way we think, let's take, uh, I don't know, this um, buyout, Jeff. We bought 75% of Chad in the French company in order to bring in their technologies into Russia. This is not uh, an issue. What is at issue is that uh, Russia's transportation system has been developing along some different lines, along some different perceptions. Uh, railroad uh, has never been looked at as uh, <laughs> um, a line of work uh, or some pr profits making uh, enterprise. And little attention has been paid on building uh, highways and building hubs and uh, terminals. So this is something that um, the Russian transportation system is faced with today. And it, this is something that should not be dealt with only by my company, which is the Russian Railroad Systems Company. This is something that needs to be looked at strategically, including all of the uh, factors of, uh, and elements of the infrastructure. This is not about building for your own sake. This is about making sure that the whole, there should be an overall approach, some kind of a long-term uh, approach indeed. So thank you very much. I enjoyed our discussion, Mr. Uh, so we'll let us in a couple of seconds. Much. I will be very brief. I realize we're over time. I just have two words that I'm going to leave you with, and they come from research that we've done at the Boston Consulting Group. One is positioning. The, the label for the topic today was supply chains and thinking about how you position yourself in value chains that are changing very dynamically is crucial. And the second is very related adaptability. I think that anything that governments can do to help industry and to help its own policy be adaptable is what is going to be winning in the current world, which is again very dynamic, where things are shifting dramatically in, in a global scale and where Thinking statically about industrial development is a thing of the past. So positioning, adaptability, I think those will take you, together with some of the things that we've heard, many, thing, many pieces of the puzzle we have heard already. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, because I would like to open the floor as well. Right, to the audience. The floor is open for your questions. If you could introduce yourself first. B. Petron, CEO, Middle CSS Business. How do Russian large companies uh, work in terms of uh, interacting with small and medium sized businesses? I know that Siemens has uh, some good practices in this. You can download the, sa the procedures that uh, middle-sized businesses need to interact with the Siemens using their website. How about Russian companies? The answer is yes, we do have a special floor uh, for tenders. Um, we um, publish our bidding procedures uh, on our website, and we have a large engineering center in St. Petersburg. All of our bids are made uh, openly, so go ahead and uh, participate, uh, participate in our bidding process. You're welcome. Uh, more questions, please. Joe of Alexander, Vice President, Finnish uh, Power Consortium for the. My question goes to one of the panelists, particularly Mr. Maho, for example. Uh, right, you, uh, you're right saying that we need to, Russia needs to uh, become less dependent on oil and gas revenues and prices go up. And, but at the same time, our um, gas is still cheaper than, I guess, elsewhere, like in America, regardless of this shale gas revolution. Same goes for uh, our oil um, that is cheaper than elsewhere in the world. So. Um, 
how exactly can we become less dependent on oil, uh, thus seeking investments into um, high technologies. When somewhat lore was opened back in the 60s, the Soviet Union, as a matter of fact, was ripe in making this shift towards high tech, but it failed to do so. My question, again, is power has to be cheap or uh, expensive. A cheap thus enabling us to do something else, or expensive to be able to generate more revenues. Thank you for your question. Uh, I'm uh, working on the subcommittee for uh, high-tech innovations, and in the future, if you'll mix the share uh, in the world as a share of natural gas, uh, natural gas, I'm sorry, tends to be growing because this is the um, the uh, least uh, uh, in damaging resource in terms of the environment. The flip side of this dependence that Russia has on oil and gas uh, boils down to the following. We are, uh, um, uh, have not been very smart in uh, using the revenues we have been generating from exporting oil and gas. The idea is to optimize, to streamline the way we use the revenues, uh, uh, we, um, the, so this is exactly what Russian mechanical engineering industry has to do. This is our mission, our job, our group, take our job. We build um, refi all refineries and gas distribution networks, and this is what we do. So we, we being not part of the oil and gas sector, we invest in the oil and gas sector. Thank you very much, says the moderator. Uh, in fact, we have not been seeking, nor have we, m I mean, we have not been able to answer the question, nor have we been seeking that. And, uh, and I think that we maybe raised, we offered uh, you uh, maybe a chance to um, approach our challenges uh, uh, through some innovative prisms and Gazprom Bank in a way of advertisement um, has pretty much been promoting uh, the need for us to remodel our, our economic patterns. And uh, I'm positive and confident that uh, whatever we are witnessing right now and the financial sector is, I mean, are we part of the financial banking sector, right? This is something that reflects the deep currents that uh, take place in the real sector of economy, which is the manufacturing sector. So there's a lot of common ground by uh, joining our efforts, we can uh, um, achieve uh, positive results, as Mr. Rishkov said. Why don't we just uh, control?